Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Salt Lake Center for Spiritual Living. Happy autumn. I'm not going to say happy fall because that <laughs> has a different meaning. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Um, it's so nice to see a clear blue sky um, and not a whole lot of smoke and and it's so nice to see your smiling faces in here. Welcome, everybody, who chose to join us in person. Um, thanks to the volunteers that made that safely possible. Welcome to all those viewing online and tuned in today. Um, very special day, very special service for you today. We're going to start with an opening song called Jump. As we bravely, fearlessly, faithfully jump into our life. One, two, three, four. so happy that you joined us at the Salt Lake Center for Spiritual Living. My name is Linda Brewer, and we are a spiritual community where all are welcome to join us online. <laughs> and 30 of you are welcome to join us right here in person, and we've never reached that number. So if you've been staying home thinking, oh, probably I won't get in, you will. So come on down. Our practitioner holding high watch this morning is Katie Hernandez throughout the service. She will be in prayer knowing that the best and highest is unfolding as we share this sacred time together. Our community is a spiritual community that teaches a philosophy for daily living based on spiritual principles and practices that are universal among religions. We honor every pathway by which people seek to know and connect with the divine and we work on our individual consciousness so that we can help make the world a better place. And we're going to talk more about that today. If you will, I invite you wherever you are to join us in saying with feeling our purpose statement. We are an open, welcoming community, celebrating our divinity, loving our humanity, and nurturing our journeys of spiritual discovery. Thank you so much. Please remember that for all the latest information on what's going on, or if you're new to our center and you'd like to find out more about who we are, you can do that at our website, which is www.spirituallyfree.org. On our homepage, you can submit a prayer request, see what's coming up next Sunday, and go to all, and it'll take you to lots of other places on the site where you can watch previous services, read about the folks who do stuff around here, and see the upcoming themes and so much more. The theme for this month is Facing the Fear, and I will be your speaker this morning. 
Next week, <laughs> thank you. Next week, we're blessed to be welcoming back Cameron Carver as we begin our October theme, Cosmic Connections. Do, 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 do. <laughs> For all the details on any of today's announcements and lots more about what's going on at the center, stuff from our home office, which is a lot of stuff, and also information from the Greater Salt Lake community, um, please visit the announcements page on the website. That gets updated the minute we have a new announcement, so anytime you're wanting to know what's happening, go right there. If you have not yet registered for the 2020 census, the deadline has been restored to the end of October. You who? But please don't wait until the last minute. The census impacts the amount of money our state receives from the federal government as well as the number of our representatives in Congress, among many other things. So it's truly essential that everyone participate. Registration is for everyone who lives in our country regardless of immigration status, and there are no questions about your status on the census, and answers by law remain confidential for 72 years. Don't know why 72 years, but that's it. You can fill that out at my2020census.gov, and that information is on the website. As I do whenever I am up here, I'd like to remind you that our center was founded on and is grounded in prayer, um, which helps us to deal with the things that are going on in the world. Our professional prayer practitioners are trained in the art and science of affirmative prayer, and they stand ready to pray with you um, at any time. You can submit a prayer request on the website, and if you do, we will get that out to all the practitioners who will be praying for you. And if you would like to actually have a prayer with a practitioner, I know a lot of us miss coming up at the end of the talk and getting to pray with a practitioner. But they will do that with you on the phone if you just say that in your prayer request. So please take advantage of that service That's because we're here for you. And now I want to invite you to settle in, allow Teresa's reading and the beautiful centering music to take you to that sacred place within. And then Teresa will share her, our prayer. Just a little discombobulated, haven't been here for a while. <laughs> you exist that the divine feeling, fire, imagination, and creativity can be expressed through you. The spirit comes to you with a new and fresh creativity. You need not ask what others have done or how they have done it. Be yourself and express the life as you and just, just know that the divine as you will find yourself in God and God will find itself in you. There is a pattern of, perf of perfection at the center of your being which has never been touched by disease or misfortune. Your intellect, through intuition, your imagination feels it by divine right. Your inward consciousness knows it through faith. What you are trying to do is to awaken your whole being to spiritual awareness. It is the intuition and the subconscious self which needs renewing. Spirit neither sleeps nor slumbers. Spirit is God. Any maladjustments will be healed when you realize this perfect center within yourself. The vision you must catch and hold is the consciousness of a union so complete that you find no difference between your, own, between your own being and God. The two are one. Every step I take 
grateful and I surrender I surrender all my thoughts my actions my words and my deeds to that presence within I am held in the arms of the beloved this beloved expresses as me it expresses as everyone we are each that unique expression of the divine. And I claim this, I claim all of it as I recognize each and every one in that divinity. That divinity holds me tight. It holds me in expression. It is all that I am. So on this beautiful Sunday morning, I welcome that divinity into my life and I surrender all my thoughts, actions, deeds and words into that wondrous, magnificent being that resides within us. I surrender it. I know it. It is here present in everything and everyone. There is no doubt about that. So I bless this day and each and every one for this day, for everyone that has brought this service to us, allowing us to be present and to consider and realize that presence within us. I am so grateful as together we say, and so it is. Well, I feel high. Uh, nothing can, can pop my balloon today. I'm filled with hope. Um, I got a text message while I showed up here first thing this morning. Um, I, I am a grandfather again. I have a, <clears throat> a new baby granddaughter was born early this morning, and um, it's amazing what that new life um, does to my consciousness. Um, um, I have hope, and I can't say that I've felt that way um, often <laughs> the last few months, mm -hmm. but I do. I hope it's contagious. <clears throat> um, we're going to sing a song together. Um, this is a great song by Matthew West. Uh, introduced by um, uh, Delan uh, to me. That, that's just a great song. Um, I invite you to sing along. It's called Do Something. Two, three, four. <laughs> Woke up this morning. 
this morning Saw a world full of trouble Now I thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever gonna turn around? So I turned my mind to spirit Thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of People living in poverty Children sold into slavery The thought disgusted me So I turned my mind to heaven It's my pleasure to introduce some special music today. We haven't heard from this young lady in a long time. And she didn't want me to say a lot about her and just go on and on, because I could do that. She just wanted me to um, tell you that she is enjoying her journey. And I see that. Um, there's evidence in every interaction I have with Melman Love. Uh, we're friends on Facebook, and she is so much better than I am about posting positive things on a regular basis. Um, her heart is in everything that she does. She's a great mom and an accomplished musician, um, and I'm, I'm so proud that she's sharing her music today. Let's welcome Mel Menlove.
now I get to introduce our speaker for today. Um, I could go on and on about Reverend Linda Brewer, too. Um, I'm just going to give a little snippet um, that maybe you didn't know. If you've ever been to Linda's house, it is filled with little special knickknacks. Um, the walls, it seems like every surface, and it's very carefully, very thoughtfully placed about her house. You walk down the hallway, anywhere in her house, um, there's these wonderful little things, and Linda could tell you a beautiful story about each one of those things. I know that those things carry an energy uh, just in their memory, um, but also the, just the tangible thing itself. And I think it, it says a lot about Reverend Linda. Um, she's very sought, thoughtful herself, and she, those things mirror back to her, those things are, that are so important to her, those, those valuable treasures on her walls and surfaces in her home. She always has a wonderful message for us, and uh, it's imbued with that beautiful energy. Let's give a, a warm welcome for Reverend Linda Bloor. That is the nicest way anybody has told me what a pack rat I am. <laughs> I think it comes from growing up in the military and moving every few years and things disappearing. And so now I cling to those treasures. Um, before I get started, I also want to say that um, until I worked on this talk today, that last congregational song, Do Something, hadn't hit me the way it did today. And so if you're at all inspired by what I have to say today, and you don't want to listen to it all over again, just go listen to that song again, because it'll give you the same message, hopefully. All right, so our theme this month has been facing the fear. And each week, the topic has been about faith, which seems to imply that faith is what is necessary to face and even overcome our fear. Cameron started off the month by saying faith is the psychological equivalent of our beliefs and programming, pointing out that faith is neither positive nor negative, and that we are always operating from faith. The question is, first, are we operating from faith consciously or unconsciously? And secondly, in what are we having faith? Unless we're conscious about where we place our faith, we will not achieve the positive outcomes that some of the best-known quotes about faith seem to imply magically happen, and which often left me wondering what's wrong with me when what I said I wanted and believed didn't come into being. The second week, Myrna continued to clarify how faith operates for us with her frog and toad story, reminding us that we are programmed by others with certain expectations about how life will be and unless we consciously choose which expectations to allow in or follow, we will unconsciously create our lives based on those learned expectations. We can choose to have faith in something outside ourselves or to have the faith of God. Last week, Randy shared that faith and fear are two sides of the same coin two options of how to respond to what life brings us. He reported that faith is a function of choosing to respond from our hearts with love to whatever comes our way. Fear results from responding from our head, from the stored programming from others, along with what we've added with the stories we can make up about what bad things could happen to us. Each of them reminded us that positive faith can be consciously chosen, can be developed by meaningful, regular spiritual practice, by curiosity about what is, rather than preconceived ideas about what we encounter, by being intentional about where we focus our consciousness, 
and the people that we allow into the front row of our lives and what we give attention to. Our positive faith is the result of the intentions we set and our follow through in doing the spiritual work necessary to manifest those intentions. The topic that I've been given for today is just do it, the Nike slogan. It falls to me to remind each of us that we are called to put our highest faith into action, to put what we learn through the teachings here and our personal growth journeys into acting in the world and serving others. The notes from home office on the topic began like this. When faith inspires, we are called into action of some sort. It could be prayer, pastoral care, service to the community, or other creative action. The point is when we block, hinder, and are outside the flow of faith, we stagnate rather than flourish and thrive. Action is vital to faith. It's easy to have faith if we sit in a room tucked away from others, but true faith requires activity in the world. The law of circulation requires inward and outward focused action. Our home office has been very busy this year, providing a plethora of webinars and other learning opportunities. One that I found particularly compelling was called Liberation Through Inclusion with the Reverends Rafe Ellis and David Alexander. They reminded us that the underlying philosophy of new thought does a good job of affirming our solidarity with all of humanity. It affirms that we are one, one with God and one with each other. Part of what discussed is the difference between a philosophy which is personal and concerned with self-interest and a theology which is communal having to do with the relationships of the divine, with its creation, with humanity, and the relationship each of us has with all of our brothers and sisters. A philosophy allows us to focus on what's in it for me. How do these teachings help me be happier, more prosperous, get the job, car, relationships, inner peace that I want? Myrna reminded us how many of us in New Thought first learned how to use these teachings by manifesting parking places. Positive reinforcements told us that the teachings work, that through our thoughts and intentions, we can create our experience. But if we are committed to our global heart vision, we are called to embrace not just the philosophy, but the theology of science of mind to move beyond what works for me and be part of creating a world that works for everyone. I think it's difficult to pay attention to what's happening in our world today, except for Rick's new grandbaby, and tell ourselves that the world is working for everyone. Over 200,000 people have died in our country from the pandemic that has swept the world. Many are facing financial devastation and the loss of jobs or businesses they spent a lifetime building. Racial unrest is pervasive. One side of the country is literally on fire, while the other side is being pummeled by the relentless rains and winds of multiple hurricanes. Our country is as politically polarized as it has ever been at any time in its history in ways that are tearing families and churches and organizations apart. And it is in this environment that we are called to put our faith in action, to treat and move our feet, to be part of creating a world that works for everyone. I don't know about you, but I've certainly been having difficulty trying to figure out how best to do that. Then in the midst of all that, nine days ago came the news of the death of someone that I believe has been a shining example of spending a lifetime putting faith into action and working to create a world that works for everyone. 
I couldn't bring myself to speak this morning and not talk a bit about the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the second female support pre-court justice. Her passing brought me personally great sorrow. And unfortunately, it created more polarization and distress in the insanity that is our current world. And I say insanity because during her Supreme Court confirmation process in 1993, she was honest and forthright about who she was, including stating her support for abortion rights, among other things. Yet she was confirmed in a 96 to 3 Senate vote. The most recent justice was confirmed with a 50 48 vote. Something is deeply wrong with our country. In addition to my grief, though, her passing also caused me to reflect on some of what has evolved in the world in my lifetime, some of the ways in which it is better, at least for women like me, better than it was when I was a child. And much of that is Ginsburg's legacy. In many ways, she made more of an enduring difference to the disenfranchised women in our country before she became a judge than she did after. Although her legacy on the court is legendary and her descents are blueprints for a more inclusive world. Her passion, her calling, the focus of how she put her beliefs and faith into action was to work tirelessly to end the inequities of gender discrimination in our country. This woman made law review at both Harvard and Columbia, graduated first in her class from law school in 1959, and could not get a job as a lawyer at any law firm. I can't imagine that happening today, so that's progress. She and her husband, Marty, modeled a true marriage of equals that was extraordinary at that time of, in our history and probably still is relatively rare. She won five of the six cases she argued before the Supreme Court. And rather than asking the court to end all gender discrimination at once, Ginsburg charted a strategic course, taking aim at specific discriminatory statutes and building on each successive victory. She chose plaintiffs carefully, at times picking male plaintiffs, to demonstrate that gender discrimination is harmful to both men and women. The laws Ginsburg targeted, including those that on the surface appeared beneficial to women, but in fact reinforced the notion that women needed to be dependent on men. Ginsburg said, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. She was a brilliant example of someone who lived her life knowing that each step she took, each case she won, each decision or dissent she delivered would, with patience, make a collective and significant impact. Asked about her legacy, Ginsburg said, to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is. One lives not just for oneself, but for one's community. And so we too are called, called to find a way to put our faith into action, to make life a bit better for those less fortunate than we are, to live not just for ourselves, but for our community to practice not only the science of mind philosophy, but its theology. To each ask ourselves, what is mine to do to help make the world work for everyone? You cannot look around this world and possibly think there's nothing you can do. There are responsibilities right here at our center that want filling, and I invite you each to search your hearts and ask yourself if one of these is yours to do. Our events chair just resigned with last week's picnic being her last event. 
I'm told a fun time was had by all and that the music was awesome. Um, but it's also the last such event that will happen if no one steps up into that position. Our communications chair also stepped down and we've divided those responsibilities but still need someone to take on the weekly email newsletter. After October 23rd, that newsletter will no longer go out if no one steps up. About 120 people open that email each week out of the 600 or so who receive it. That's actually a good percentage, I'm told. All those folks won't get that information or will have to go search it out on Facebook or the website if someone doesn't answer the call to put their faith into action in that way. Those are just a couple of things that I came up with. I'm sure our center could use help in many other ways. Now, I have no illusion that those jobs are going to change the world, but they will positively impact our spiritual community. Beyond that, the greater Salt Lake community has many needs, as does our state, our country, our world. It is up to each of us to go inside and prayerfully consider how best we can put our faith into action to help make our world work for everyone. Everything I read about faith in action as I was preparing for today reminded me that our actions must arise from our spiritual practice, from discerning what my true calling is of how to save, serve the world. And beyond the doing and the acting, we are called to do the spiritual work that allows us to truly know that a world that works for everyone is possible. I admit I've been struggling to know that. Because the evidence that so many are left out of the American dream is all around me. I go back and forth between hope and hopelessness. History reminds me that there have been many times in the lifetime of our country where our divisions were great, where so many were disenfranchised from equal protection and equal opportunity under the law. Thomas Jefferson's words run through my mind at times when he said, when I reflect that God is just, I fear for my country. The inequities are so obvious to me. And then I remember, as a 10-year-old child questioning the white and colored water fountains at the dime store when we moved to Alabama from Germany. That's no longer how things are. Or when I started graduate school at the Young Life Institute in 1969, the male staff were called men. The female staff were called girls. The men were required to do all six units that were needed for the degree. The girls were allowed to do two. Those of you who know me probably won't be surprised to learn that I, of course, protested and did the whole program. <laughs> I'm heartened, as I've mentioned before, that 70% of the clergy of CSL are women. Then disheartened that 25% of Congress is female when we make up 51% of the population. I can be a pa impatient, especially when so many are suffering. And then I remember the words of Martin Luther King Jr. that he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And I cling to that hope. I find it irritating that I just can't change the whole world with a wave of my magic wand or my prayers. But in preparing for today, I was reminded by Reverend Lynn of a sermon that Ernest Holmes gave at another difficult time in our country. And I found his words so appropriate that most of the rest of what I'm going to share will be the words of that sermon. He reminds us that job one is our spiritual knowing the best and highest truth. In this case, about our country and the principles on which it was founded. Those principles have yet to become reality for all who live here, 
but the moral arc has been continually bending. When the nation first began, under the Constitution, the only people allowed to vote, about 6% of the population, were white male landowners. Blacks, natives, women, non-property owners were all excluded. Think about that. Much progress has been made, but not nearly enough. But Holmes' words reminded me of the importance of holding the highest vision and out of that knowing, moving into action. His words ask us to hold in mind the vision on which this country was founded and invites a rededication to putting our faith into action to make that vision a reality for all. We are still falling far short of that vision being realized, especially for our black and brown brothers and sisters, as evidenced by a system that allows police to break into an innocent woman's home and murder her without consequence. The verdict in Breonna Taylor's murder is more evidence of how the system is broken and not at all reflective of the ideals which the founders of our country set forth. Even though they failed to see how the system that they set up allowed those privileges only for a minority of those who actually lived in this land. Thanks to Ginsburg, we are closer to the ideal being a reality for women at least white women. Thanks to Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, and many others, the ideal for people of color has progressed toward realization. Now we are called to make it true for all. I want to be hopeful that the crisis of inequity that has manifested in many ways in 2020 can lead to change that is permanent and good, something that will make the world a better place in which to live a place with individual and collective safety, personal liberty, freedom, and justice for all. As you hear these words from our founder, my prayer is that we each rededicate ourselves to the country's founding vision and our global heart vision, to doing our part to create a country and a world that works for everyone. These are the words Holmes shared 70 years ago. Freedom is something that is won with difficulty and kept only through eternal vigilance. And what does freedom really mean as it works out through the only instrument that can maintain its purpose, the instrument of government, other than the idea that all people are equal before God? that everyone is an individual in their own right, and that each should have the privilege of self-expression, provided their desires do not infringe on the rights of others. Democracy is a great cooperative enterprise through which this is made possible. It would be advisable for us to reread the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States and think about their meaning all over again. Here we find not only the supreme ideal in government, but the specific and, and definite directions for working it out. A federal union so organized that it may protect the interests of the common good without infringing on the rights of the individual citizen. Our forefathers were wise indeed when they worked out a system which bound all together in one common purpose, without overlooking the fact that each is an individual, that every state and each political subdivision down to the precinct in which you and I live should be able to preserve its identity and integrity from the largest to the smallest. Those who wrote these two great documents surely did so under divine guidance. The great lesson that life is trying to teach us is that we are all rooted in God, but each is an individualized center in the divine being, what Emerson called unity at the center and variety at the circumference. Unity does not mean uniformity. It means a oneness of purpose. 
We have checks and balances so that no one group at the top can dictate the policies of the lesser groups down the scale of our political system. The hope of the world rests. I want to say that again. The hope of the world rests on the preservation of the system. All shall contribute the best they have that the strong shall protect the weak without overpowering them. That the great shall live with the small without subduing them. That cooperation shall take the place of aggression. That government shall rule without tyranny through the common consent of the governed, of the people, by the people, for the people. That which was born of faith must be kept through faith. As never before our thoughts, our meditations, our hopes, and our prayers must rise as one common accord. You and I should form the habit of taking definite time each day to pray for peace with justice. For there is no peace possible without justice. To meditate affirmatively with complete acceptance that our leaders everywhere are being guided by the all-sustaining wisdom and upheld by the all-sustaining power of good. And we should pray for the peace of our own minds that we shall not become confused. But faith without works is dead. We should not only pray, we should act, each contributing the best we have to the common purpose, each willing to make any sacrifice necessary. There can be no individual self-preservation without the preservation of all. For if the whole world works together and prays together, a great moral and spiritual power, an actual soul force, will penetrate the whole world, helping to bring confidence and calm judgment and right action until the crisis shall have passed. Faith will always conquer fear. The world is perhaps at the point of the greatest crisis in all human history. And there seem to be two attitudes we can assume. One is calmness, faith, and conviction. The other would be despair. And despair is unthinkable. Let each of us in our own way dedicate our time, our service, our hope, and our spiritual conviction to the common cause of liberty and justice for all. Let's work without tiring and pray without ceasing and know that something alive with meaning is taking place. Something vibrant with hope is happening. Something latent with the possibility of the future is being conceived. And so my friends, as we prepare to be in prayer together, I challenge you this week to put your faith into action. Just do it. Whether it is praying in the knowing way that Holmes suggested, political action, community service, do what is yours to do to help make the ideals on which this country was founded the reality for each and every person who lives in this land so that from this it can spread into the rest of the world. Together, let us affirm that the divinely inspired vision of true democracy on which this country was founded finally becomes an actual reality for each and every person who lives in our land. May we live up to our potential and manifest our founding father's vision of true democracy and the global heart vision of a world that works for everyone. Let's pray. And so we settle in into that sacred space within us that connects us with that which created us and with all else that lives, with all of our brothers and sisters on the planet with the lands and the waters that nourish us. 
with the animals that bring us joy and the people that offer us opportunities for love. Let us know today comfort for those who mourn. Those who mourn Ruth Bader Ginsburg, those who mourn the 200 plus thousand of those who have been taken by the COVID virus. All the others who are gone, many of whom left us with a legacy that calls us to come up higher, that calls us to ask, what is mine to do? We can do it. We can do it if we come from that holy place within us and move into righteous action. And let us know together today for the leaders of our country and the leaders of the world that they come from a place of caring, a place of wanting the ideal of a world that works for everyone to in fact be reality. Let us hold that vision together. If enough of us can know that, if enough of us cannot get so, so sucked into hopelessness and despair, but know that there are times we've been better and we can be that again. That there is work yet to do and we can do that work. And so in gratitude for that ideal vision on which this country was founded and the ideal vision, the global heart vision of our centers for spiritual living that affirms a world that works for everyone. We claim this is true. We release our word into the law knowing that it is done. As together we say, and so it is. are so very blessed. So now is the time of our conscious giving, which in our center is one of our spiritual practices. It's something that we do for our own spiritual health and well-being. We recognize that the blessings that have come to us, we give thanks for those and we take them in. And as part of the law of circulation, we send those blessings back out some of that to our center here so that it continue can, can continue to do the work that is ours to do here. Um, we know that some of you are, have been facing incredible changes in your financial situation during this last six months or so, and we just are knowing for you that that goes away, that it is cleared that you are again blessed to be part of the divine flow.
And we are so grateful to those of you who have continued to support the work of this center. Um, your gift, giving and your gift means more now than it ever has in the past. So thank you so very much. And I promise you that your board is doing the very job, best job that it can to be good stewards of what you give to us. So in the spirit of gratitude and good, I invite you to bring your gift into your mind and into your heart as we speak together our giving blessing, knowing the truth of these words. Divine love as me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Filled with gratitude, I let this be, and so it is. Welcome back, Mel Menlove, to play some more special music.
Beautiful job, Mel. Wow. Okay. So we had some fun. We got some culture. We had a really good preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Such a blessed day. I want to invite you to um, those of you that are here and those of you also who are tuning in, we're going to have a meditation service after this one. Um, we tried it out last week and it worked beautifully, so we're going to do that. So we in, in the band will leave quietly and carefully and allow a nice meditation space to take place here. So I invite you to stay and stay tuned in uh, for that. Um, following that will be the, the live chat hosted by Reverend Myrna Hurst. Um, so you can link into that as well. Um, I think I was supposed to say something else. No, I want you to stand on your feet without holding hands. We're going to sing our closing song. Um, keeping in mind, we're creating a world that works for everyone. It's a song called Together We Can Change the World. Thanks for coming, everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I believe it's not too late. Together we can change the world. Lay the puzzle pieces out. Find out what it's all about. Together we can change the world. I could stop this by myself.